Welcome everyone to Virtual Darwin Day. I'm Carrie. I'm an educator at the museum and I will be your host for this very exciting program. So we are going to, are going to be talking about mammal hair today. Um, and um, since we are not having a slideshow, I am going to skip our Zoom tutorial. However, I do want you to know that we have live captioning available um, for this program. Um, and so if you just go to the bottom of your screen, click subtitles, show subtitles, and then you'll be able to see the captions. Um, so our icebreaker question is, what mammal has the coolest hair? So this is an opinion question. So put your answer in the chat. Um, and um, as we're going, I will uh, introduce our speaker today. So Dr. Michael Cove is um, the curator of mammals at the museum. So he does a lot of, you know, he um, works down in the collections, does all of our mammal work. Um, and he's going to be walking us through the collection. So this is a really special program. This is one of my favorite parts of our museum. Um, and this is an area that is not accessible to the public. So we're getting a really cool glimpse um, into this. So... Um, Mike, why don't you take it over? Okay, am I here? You can see me, yeah. you can hear me? We see you, okay. we hear you. All right, perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Mike Cove. I am the curator of mammals here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. And I'm giving you a special behind the scenes look at some of the uh, a mammal collection that uh, I hold so near and dear to my heart here. And so what you might not realize is that the, uh, the exhibits that you see in the museum itself are only a small fraction of what we house here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. So I'm uh, at literally two stories underground uh, in our research collection. And so our mammalogy collection has over 25,000 specimens. So I'm just pacing here a little. You could see some bones, some fragments, and then you could also see, you know, some of these giant vertebrae. So the, uh, you know, the impressive whales that you see upstairs are not the only whales we have here in the collection. We actually have entire racks of them. And the important thing is to remember why we have museums is for research. And so it's fitting that I'm giving this talk here to you today on Darwin Day or to, to celebrate virtual Darwin Day, because if you think about uh, Darwin as a naturalist, he was always out um, uh, collecting species and taking measurements and uh, preserving those specimens for other museums uh, in London, uh, in the UK. And we have this, a similar collection, maybe not quite as old, but some of our some of our specimens here do date back to the mid 1800s when Darwin was formulating his uh, uh, theories of natural selection and writing the origin of species. And so uh, think about what we do as we are kind of the librarian. So all of these specimens down here have records and data on uh, where they were collected and when they were collected. And this is effectively a library of, of biodiversity. And so we could look back where species historically occurred, where they occur now, and where they're going to continue to occur into the future. And so it's really kind of the, you know, it's really gets me excited being down here because you never get a chance to see this many cool uh, mammals up close and personal. Um, so we are talking about a uniquely mammalian trait today, hair, right? Mammals, uh, the, the, the name mammal comes from, is derived from mammary, uh, mammals produce milk, but we also all have hair. Even though some species like whales, uh, the whales have uh, secondarily lost their hair. But I am going to show you uh, a few examples of some things. So here's an example of something that looks pretty, uh, pretty hair-like. This looks to be uh, mammal hair, right? long, bristly guard hairs. If anyone wants to type into the chat what they think that might be, I'm gonna slowly zoom out to show you 
Because remember, I said it, whales have secondarily lost their hair when they reverted back to um, an aquatic uh, oceanic state. These are baleen. These are the hair-like structures within the mouth of a humpback whale and other baleen whales. And they use them, they, they fill their mouths full of water and then pump the water back out through these hair-like structures, baleen. And baleen are actually still made of keratin. And so they are a functionally and effectively very similar to hair. So this is kind of a neat adaptation that uh, baleen whales have for feeding to, to kind of house those giant bodies. But when we think about hair and the adaptations, probably one of the first things that comes to mind, oops, did I turn my video off? Um, probably one of the first things that comes to mind when it comes to hair, keeps us warm. Uh, some of these African ungulates above my shoulder there, they're not necessarily trying to keep warm. They're usually trying to uh, figure out ways to stay cool in the African savannas. But one of the most iconic species here uh, from North America is right over here over my shoulder. Let me see if I can get this queued up right. The um, North American bison. Ooh. Uh, we go. So here is... <laughs> Let me see. I'm having a little bit of technical difficulty here. This, ah, there we go. Perfect. Okay. North American bison, right? And so this is one of the most iconic prairie species um, native to all of the Great Plains and prairies of North America. They were historically almost completely extirpated due to uh, un unregulated hunting and killing. But if you think about a bison and look at, look at how uh, robust and bushy that hair is. But that's only to get through the winter. And then in the uh, spring, uh, they molt and then almost look like a naked cow, right? They have very, very light uh, hair to get through uh, the summer months when they're staying cool. But you can often see photos of them with this big bushy coat in the winters uh, covered in, in icicles and coated in ice. And so um, probably even more iconic, then the bison is, uh, let's see here, is this guy, the uh, polar bear, right? And so the polar bear is an obvious character that needs to uh, use hair to insulate itself to stay warm uh, because they are a completely Arctic uh, species. And what's interesting is polar bear hair is not actually white. There is no white pigmentation in the polar bear's hair and it's actually hollow and translucent. And so um, the, the uh, whiteness comes from the reflection of that light and the bear's skin underneath that hair is actually black. And these, these hollow translucent hairs help funnel and trap that light and you know, light ba is bouncing around and helps warm that black skin underneath to stay, uh, to stay warm here. Um, and so they're, you know, a fascinating Arctic species that is, you know, probably the mo the single most iconic uh, um, species from from the cold tundras of uh, basically the global Arctic. But another one closer to home that has lots of that has strong hair history here in North Carolina. So here's our our shelves for the for the collection, and I'm going to pull out a drawer here. And so this is how most of our research collections are stored in these big airtight sealed drawers. And this is uh, the largest North American rodent, the beaver, right? And so um, beavers were actually the kind of the peak uh, economic trading value for uh, Native Americans and for uh, colonists when they when they colonized, and there were actually wars. There were actual beaver wars over these pelts. And so the beaver, uh, the economic growth in North America and in Europe uh, kind of hit its, its peak in the mid 19th century. And by uh, 19, 1897, the last beaver was ever documented in North Carolina. They were effectively extirpated, even though they historically occurred throughout the entire 
Canada, um, further into Canada, and even into um, Mexico along the Colorado River. Uh, and so the beavers, I'm sure you are familiar that beavers do live in North Carolina, and that's because of successful conservation stories where in 1939, 29 beavers were, were captured in Pennsylvania and restocked by the uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. And then again in the 1950s, another 54 were stocked. And by the uh, 60s, they estimated, uh, 60s and 70s, they estimated that there were uh, probably in the thousands of beavers. Beavers are important ecosystem engineers, which means, you know, they don't just knock over trees willy-nilly here, they're actually building structures to stop the flow of water, and they create important wetlands and, um, and habitat for a whole variety of species, including critically endangered butterflies out of Fort Bragg, and a whole, a whole slew of other uh, endangered plants and, and animals. So really uh, neat species, very cool, Car North Carolina native, and they are you know, really a conservation success story. Uh, so, Michael, considering I have a question. Yes. So, what, what, were there were they extirpated in any other states or just North Carolina? Oh, they were extirpated from most of North America. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. And so um, much of uh, the beaver populations throughout the country um, are uh, are um, the, the success stories of reintroductions and regulations of fur bearing, uh, fur bearer trapping regulations. There's a moose over my shoulder just uh, to keep you entertained here and uh, a woodland caribou over the shoulder as well. But so uh, I, I use that term fur bearer. So fur bearers were uh, kind of the bread and butter of uh, of Native American culture and trading and European culture and trading in North America. And so uh, the beaver was obviously the pinnacle was, uh, has the densest fur of most of, of all of these species that I'm going to cover now at, because they're aquatic and they create this oil that helps insulate them. And so they made these perfect very, very warm insulated coats. But other fur bear, important fur bearers that we have here in the state um, include these, these individuals, the, the foxes. These are gray foxes, um, one of the smaller. Sometimes they're called the cat fox, actually. Um, and that's because they have a shorter uh, snout and, um, and are sometimes uh, uh, more arboreal than their uh, relatives, the, the kind of more commonly seen or observed a red fox. And so here's a, a red fox. So these are a little bit larger than the gray fox, um, more terrestrial. And uh, red foxes globally are important fur bearers. And what's interesting in terms of the history of the red fox in North America is that they are native species. There is a, a misconception that red foxes don't believe, belong here because they were introduced by Europeans. And the truth is red foxes were here uh, historically, prehistorically, and are native to, um, to North America, but they were also supplemented with European red foxes uh, when they were hunting, um, you know, hundreds of years ago. And so, uh, so that is an interesting little tidbit about um, red foxes and uh, their roles in the ecosystems. Red foxes are also quite a bit interesting because they are more adaptable seemingly than the gray foxes and occur um, very frequently in urban environments. And so you can see these individuals probably hanging out, um, you know, in more industrialized areas, habitats, and, uh, and they're just super adaptable, both species of foxes. But another uh, canid so while we're- I have in another, I have a question about the red foxes. So are the, is the North American species and the European species, is it the same species? So- It is the same species, yes. Interesting. So what, how do you, that, how is that <laughs> evolutionarily, how does that work? Is it, were they just, did they um, just expand their range like across like, you know, the Bering Strait? Or whatever. Across the across the Bering Strait, yes, yes. Yeah. So, okay. um, so there are subspecies across their range, 
um, for, for, you know, um, red foxes, but they do occur kind of uh, uh, across the whole temperate uh, regions of North America and um, uh, Asia and Europe as well. So uh, you have red foxes um, in China, uh, Russia, all the way across through um, Eastern Eastern Europe. Uh, very and, and West, very sorry, successful Western Western species. <laughs> very successful, very successful. One of the most successful. And they're also, you know, uh, a sad story about the red fox is that they were also introduced into um, Australia, in the Australian outback. And so they are a, a, a very um, important species uh, that is causing uh, extinctions and declines of some of the native marsupials um, because they're again, very adaptable and able to um, consume all of these other um, uh, marsupial species. So they are an invasive species broadly uh, in other places. So here's another important fur bearer, coyotes. Now coyotes are actually an interesting species here in North Carolina because uh, they historically did not range into North Carolina. And in fact, much of their distribution here in the state has only been within their, their ex expansion and range in most of the state has only been within the past uh, several decades. Um, you can see coyotes, again, are another adaptable species, probably because they're able to um, eat things like uh, agricultural crops, garbage, um, other uh, fruits and, and native plants, but also other things that do well around humans, like squirrels. And show you. Um, so those are the so the, those are the some of the coyotes we have. Now coyotes seem big when you see them out in the woods or out along a path or something, but even a huge coyote is still uh, typically smaller than most dogs. Well, most uh, medium to large sized dogs. A huge coyote here in North Carolina might be 40, 45, you know, max 50 pounds. They're not quite like this um, species here. Oops, sorry, bear with me. Technical difficulties here. This is a uh, uniquely North Carolina species. This is the red wolf, right? You can see how much, just how much larger this species is uh, and robust than the smaller coyote. Now, I could do a whole segment on the red wolves. Unfortunately, I don't have time today, but the, uh, the population that we have here in North Carolina are the last remaining red wolves in the wild. And that's because they're an, an experimental population that was released out on the Albemarle Peninsula back in the 1980s. And there's been a lot of conservation work to try to restore this species in other parts of their range. Um, and these are there's ongoing debate, scientific debate, about whether this is truly a species or not, or maybe it's a hybrid of wolves and coyotes. Or, um, you know, again, I don't have enough time to talk about red wolves, but they are this fascinating creature that we have right here in our home state of North Carolina. But right above them, I will show some of the, uh, the true wolves, the uh, um, gray wolves that we have here from North America. And you could see the variety and variation in these pelts. So here's kind of your classic, uh, uh, gray wolf uh, pelt uh, pelage. Here's um, uh, more like a timber wolf with the black pelage. And um, that, that black coloration historically comes from uh, probably from uh, interbreeding, hybridizing with uh, Native Americans dog. Years ago. And so, or thousands of years ago, I should say. And then in the middle, here is, uh, this is a tundra wolf, right? You can see the white, the white coloration of this wolf that occurs um, way north of the tree lines in the tundra. And so that kind of brings me to my next uh, function of hair, which is camouflage. Right? So we have a, Camouf right, can, before we get to camouflage, I have a question in the chat. Dan yeah. wants to know um, where you stand on the red wolf debate. So in your oh professional my opinion, are they a unique species or a hybrid? 
<laughs> oh my goodness. You can, you can put on uh, the spot here. <laughs> wow. Thank you for that. Um, so I, I think that there's still ongoing uh, debate about the um, the not necess- not necessarily the role of red wolves, but whether they are in fact a, a species, a distinct population segment, or some kind of um, unique hybrid. And I think you know we're here; it's Darwin Day. Uh, speciation is a is an interesting. Uh, um, uh, factor in itself, right? Because uh, species occur through extinctions, through hybridization events. And so uh, defining what makes a red wolf a species is in, a, is in itself a difficult question to answer. I think that the latest genetic information suggests that they are something unique. They're not a, a coyote wolf hybrid, um, but it's unclear if they are truly a, a wolf, or maybe even they're a unique uh, something other than a wolf, something in between uh, coyotes and wolves. Um, thank you for the for the difficult, tricky questions here, uh, um, and getting me off off subject, off topic here. But next, let's talk about other functions of hair. Right? How about the hair uh, for camouflage? So here uh, over my shoulder, I have a jaguar. Um, and so jaguars are the largest uh, of the cats of of the native cats of North America, right? And so um, they are, are fascinating uh, predators. And so you can see the jaguars have very similar kind of convergent uh, convergent patterns with leopards. All right, leopards and jaguars look very similar. Jaguars are larger; they have stronger, uh, more robust jaws and they're formidable predators. But what's interesting is th- you can see the, the coloration helps them blend in in their um, native uh, tropical uh, rainforests and, and other arid, uh, less, less um, tropical forests throughout Central and South America. And so what's interesting is a lot of those habitats are more green. But you'll know there are there are no green mammals, right? There are no green mammals other than maybe the algae that grows on sloths, and so that's because most mammals, uh, aside a few groups like the primates, humans, uh, uh, coatis, a few other groups, have very poor vision, have very poor color vision. So camouflaged animals don't necessarily have to uh, blend in perfectly color-wise. They just have to have the modeled pattern that helps them blend in with the uh, with the background uh, leaves, branches, etc., um, for their prey, uh, so that they can uh, stay hidden from their prey. So if you think about tigers, stalk more from some grassy grassland areas, but also in forests, again, the stripes would be the same thing. But not it's not just predators that need to stay camouflaged. It's also prey uh, that really need to stay camouflaged as well. So I'm going to show you a couple cool adaptations of uh, prey camouflage here uh, in a second. Okay. Now, this is not a North Carolina native species, but it's just cool, too cool not to show. This here, these are 13 line ground squirrels. So, this is a, uh, a short grass prairie native species from uh, the Central Plains in the Midwestern US. And it, if you look at that pattern, it's, it looks fake, really. Um, it, and so, these these uh, occur in, in short grasses, and you can see that there that, that striping pattern helps them blend in with these short kind of brownish drab grasses that they live in. Now, squirrels have uh, don't just have mammal predators, right? They also have uh, avian predators, hawks, eagles, things like that. And so they do have to try to blend in better with their surroundings because uh, birds of prey have wonderful uh, uh, color and, and spectacular vision. And so you can see other species of brown squirrels here um, where they have uh, more drab coloration because they're occurring in more sandy soils. And then over here we have um, rock squirrels. And so these are and you could see how that uh, hair could blend in perfectly with um, with a rocky outcrop when you're trying to hide from predators like um, hawks 
and, uh, and probably from uh, you know other mammalian predators like bobcats. But uh, I have to show you probably the coolest North Carolina uh, native mammal that has just incredible variation in their coat color are these guys. These are uh, the um, eastern fox squirrels. So these are uh, uh, native species of North Carolina, and they occur throughout. They historically occurred throughout the state. And what you see is this broad range of variation. This is all one species. And so you have these individuals here on the left that have a lot more dark coloration. We have a few more, uh, some dark coloration, dark modeling. Here's a more dark coloration, dark modeling. Now, those individuals were collected out in the eastern part of the state, the part that was historically burned, pine plantations and, and pine savannas. And so if you're a prey species hiding out from hawks, you want to look more like the burnt ground and the burnt trunks around you. Whereas if you go out west, uh, you see individual, ignore this one, but you see individuals with this more uh, orange coat coloration. And so these individuals are out in the more densely forested west, out into the Midwest part of the uh, part of the country. And you can see they have a lot more orange coloration to blend in with tree trunks and of all the variation of this one um, really, really unique species, the fox squirrel. So Michael, I have a oh. question. So I went yep. to UNCW. Um, okay. which is in, in, in Wilmington. And of course, there's lots of fox squirrels. And there, yeah. there's huge variation just within the population on campus. Yeah. And so what, what would, wh why is that? Is it, just, is it less predatory pressure because of the kind of a more protected environment? It very well could be. I think that, um, you know, one of the things to take into consideration is that natural selection um, occurs uh, at the individual level, but also, and, and it does take time to occur and, and cause, you know, e actual evolution, but uh, that some of these changes happen so fast that uh, there's not time for uh, a true uh, selective pressures, right? And so you could have, you could have lots of variation, especially on a college campus where there, where there aren't a lot of predators that you have to um, evade is, would be my, thought. Interesting. I have another um, question. Yeah. We're talking about camouflage and why aren't like the greens and blues, like, you know, purple, why aren't these colors represented in mammals? Cause they are in other, I mean, I know some of like the mandrills will have like blue on their, on their butt, but what, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, why is it, why don't we so see? You know what's so you know what's interesting is uh, things like the the mandrills having blue on their butt, the vervet monkeys having blue testes. Um, those that coloration is not truly blue pigment. It's the uh, the way that those uh, ligaments and um, and skin. Um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, collagens uh, reflect the light that makes them look blue. There's no blue pigment uh, actually involved. So that's a, a kind of like an interesting thing. And so evolutionarily, you have to evolve. Uh, uh, you have to have a random mutation, right, that, that is uh, um, helpful for your survival to exist. And so the only green pigment that comes to mind in mammals is bile right? Uh, our digestive enzyme that's produced in our gallbladder. Our gallbladders are blue because bile is green. Now, I don't know that the, uh, <clears throat> the pigments in bile are ever going to raise to the surface and cause us to become green, but you never know uh, what happens with advan advantageous traits and and evolution and natural it's selection, just, right? Yeah, it's just inter <laughs> so interesting because, but there's so many green birds, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's yeah. So obviously, I guess it just like is so maybe because birds see so much better, it, it's more advantageous for them that, to have yes for that to have evolved for sure. So cool. Um, <clears throat> So then other species that aren't really, you know, don't really come to mind as being camouflage, but are when you really think about it, are, um, you know, things like the white-tailed deer or the um, 
pronghorn antelope, right? This is the fastest North American land mammal. Historically, their predators would have been the, uh, the North American cheetah, um, but North American cheetahs are, are extinct. And so uh, they have very few natural predators that can keep up with them. And so most of the predation on them is done by um, actually by human hunters and uh, on their neonates, their babies, when they're, when they're young, uh, they can be taken by coyotes and wolves and other uh, uh, big predators. But then even things like the white-tailed deer, right? White-tailed deer are, are effectively the most abundant large uh, herbivore in North America. And they look pretty drab, but uh, when they're moving really slow in the forest, you could tell that you, it, it can be very hard to detect them and see them, um, especially because they're, they're just so silent on those uh, narrow hooves. But a good species uh, to showcase um, camouflage or uh, natural selection would be another Arctic, well, not quite, yes, Arctic, but also high altitude, high elevation a specialist, the mountain goat, right? And so they're totally white um, uh, throughout the year. They occur at super high latitudes on these mountainous cliff sides that are mostly covered in snow uh, most of the year. And so that white coloration helps them, again, uh, blend in perfectly with the uh, snowy backgrounds of the mountain escarpments that they're uh, that they're climbing, but others there are some other species that also um, have to have to be white uh, to hide in the snow, but maybe they're not as uh, specialized or um, in areas where it's consistently snowy, like where the uh, mountain goats are. And so this is another. Uh, unique adaptation here. Uh, let's close this. Yes. Um, and so I'm going to show you, let's see, let's, older cabinets. Here we go. This is not a North Carolina uh, species, but this is a North American species. This is the snowshoe hare. And the snowshoe hare, you can see uh, the, the size of those giant feet where they get the name snowshoe. Now, snowshoe hares, uh, they molt twice a year, right? And in the winter, their, ha their hair comes back totally white to help them blend in uh, during the, during the snow-covered uh, times of the year from predators. And then it, this individual, so the, the beauty of it is you can see where they were collected and when on our tags. So this individual was collected in late January in 1955 in Northern Canada. And you could see that by late January, um, it, it's a little bit early, but you can see some of the hair start to come in. And so during the spring, uh, they will molt all their white hair and become brown to ma match the uh, no longer snow covered uh, brushy habitats that they occur in um, juniper forests and and uh, other uh, other kind of evergreen forests that they occur in. Uh, what's fascinating and interesting is there's a lot of research going into snowshoe hares now because matches. And so um, because snow is on the ground for shorter periods of the year, uh, the hares are not able to always track how fast uh, that snow disappears. And uh, unfortunately, it's causing some selective pressure where they might not be able to avoid predators because they're not as well camouflaged as they should be um, given the timing of the year. Another cool species that changes color uh, dirt throughout its life cycle, throughout its annual cycle, is the weasel, long-tailed uh, weasel here. So here are some of the individual weasels from collected in the uh, spring, summer, fall. And then here are a few pelts of individuals, uh, specimens of individuals that were collected during the winter. And then you could see some that are transitioning between the, t between the two. So um, really, really uh, species that are um, living in this kind of uh, seasonal environment where the where the uh, environment changes and the background that they need to blend in with changes over time. Uh, but let's see, there's another uh, individual over here that I'll pass by that is uh, another white individual here. 
But this is this is a, a white a white white tailed deer, right? This is an albino um, white tailed deer here, and so uh, albinism is the is the total lack of pigment. And so uh, I don't know the the history of this individual, but the beauty of being in the, in a museum is we can look up the data sheets and look at where this individual came from and um, its circumstances and when it was occurring. Um, and so uh, you know a white white tailed deer might not necessarily be advantageous um, uh, to avoid predators because, frankly, I think the white uh, coloration would make them uh, stand out more compared to the background uh, that they're occurring in. But here's another North Carolina specialty. We looked at the fox squirrels already. Here are gray squirrels, right? And I'm sure some folks have heard of the white gray squirrels in uh, over by uh, Brevard in Transylvania County, right? So these are some of those white squirrels. And some people think, well, I mean, if it's not advantageous for a, a white-tailed deer to be white, like the albino one that I just showed you, why are there so many white squirrels out in Brevard and in Transylvania County. And I, I've thought about this quite a bit. I said, well, you know, there's, there's probably snow for a, a greater portion of the year than most of the rest of the state at those high, higher elevations. But what's, what I didn't realize until I saw one in person for myself was that, um, you know, a white squirrel stands out very, very strongly against the background. And I was thinking about it because I saw it from my car. And I slowed down and I thought, you know, vehicles are probably one of the number one mortality factors for squirrels is they get, they get run over by cars. And if you're a white squirrel and you're much more visible and, and kind of frankly cool looking, I think you have a better chance of survival because people see you and get excited that you're seeing a might actually be why uh, there's more white squirrels out there in Brevard and Transylvania County. And so um, we will see what happens uh, in the next few generations. But um, uh, other gray squirrels that are, um, that are neatly adapted to uh, urban environments would be, uh, especially in, in big cities, uh, squirrels become more melanistic which is the um, uh, which is like full pigmentation, and so those those individuals would be completely black, and so the black coloration might help them blend in with um, with uh, the asphalt coloration of uh, of impervious surfaces and and um, uh, big city buildings, and so uh, next, so kind of the opposite of camouflage we're gonna get into uh, something called aposematism. Now, aposematism, the best example I could give you are the poison dart frogs. We have poison dart frogs up in, uh, up in the um, museum here, right? They have these vibrant colors that they use to showcase that they are poisonous. And then others, a few other good examples would be some different butterflies that are toxic, have bright colors to let the world know that they're toxic. And then um, venomous snakes, like coral snakes, have vibrant bright colors to showcase that they are toxic. Well, in the mammal world, it's not quite as vibrant in terms of uh, coloration, but we do have very cool aposematic a coloration representation in the mammal world in the skunks. And so uh, these are some of our striped skunks in the collection. You can see they're, they're quite large actually. And um, you can see that there's a ton of variation in their coloration. And so the, the white and the black, the contrasting colors of those uh, uh, showcase them really strongly. And that is to alert their potential predators that they are in fact a noxious species, right? Skunks can spray um, uh, their, their scents and it can really, really deter uh, predators. Um, and so here, this is interesting, check this out. We have this other, wow, this, this is a unique uh, tray of skunks here. So here's more of our striped skunks. Here's even an albino skunk. Um, but this is this is a spectacular 
uh, species. This is this is a species, a native North Carolina species that probably most people haven't seen or heard of. This is the spotted skunk. This is an eastern spotted skunk. You can see that they're quite a bit smaller than the striped skunks. They're actually about the size of a squirrel. They're, they're pretty small. Um, but this is a state uh, species of conservation concern. The, uh, unlike the striped skunks that have, um, you know, are, are omnivorous and, and do pretty well in the presence of humans, um, stripe, uh, spotted skunks have had these historical declines, and it may very well be that uh, they are not as adapted, as well adapted as some of the other uh, medium-sized carnivores that have thrived in, in, in human uh, in agricultural and urban environments like raccoons, possums, uh, striped skunks, the foxes. And um, another uh, hypothesis is that um, some of the uh, habitat changes that have happened where early successional habitat might not be um, <clears throat> as prominent as it as it would have been prehistorically, uh, make understory canopies a little more open, especially with so many white-tailed deer in some areas, where they might be easier prey for things like barred owls uh, and great horned owls that are kind of uh, immune to the funk and smell of uh, skunks and don't really have as much problem um, depredating them like other uh, like um, um, mammalian predators do. So let's see. Uh, so we went over camouflage. We went over apostomatism. Um, now I think it's time to get into the kooky stuff, right? We talk, we're talking about hair here. And there are other interesting modifications of hair um, that we have yet to look at. And so the next one I'm going to talk about, I think is probably the, probably the coolest one, would be armor. So hair can change. Uh, over time. And so here is one of my favorite trays in the entire mammal collection. These are our two pangolins. So if you've never heard of a pangolin, I'll get you a nice good close-up look. So this is uh, unfortunately a, a, a species that's become popular in the media uh, within the past few decades, because unfortunately, those scales, this, this is modified hair that have become these armored scales, um, are coveted in some of the, uh, some Asian traditional medicine purposes. Even though this is just, uh, this is just hair, this is just keratin, just like any other hair. Unfortunately, that makes this one of the most trafficked animals in the world. And so um, while this uh, armor has become uh, a great protection of it, of this species uh, from predators. You can see it covers almost all the way around and they, um, they'll roll up into this strong ball uh, to, to prevent predators from consuming them. It also has made them desir desirable to poachers, unfortunately. And so there's a lot of conservation work going on to try to save the pangolins, but this is a totally unique uh, African and Asian species. They're, um, they're insectivores. You can see they have these super, super strong claws. Um, they have uh, super long tongues and they're digging up ant mounds and termite mounds, sticking that super long tongue through uh, and, and subsisting on insects. Asian species, uh, the pangolins, there's eight species of pangolins in the world. Um, we have uh, kind of our own little convergent evolution here uh, in North America, where we have a species that from the outside looks kind of similar and has some similar traits here. Um, and we have them here in North Carolina. This is a species that has um, that has uh, become a little bit more abundant and is expanding uh, with time, uh, especially with uh, things like changing climates. We have armadillos. All right. So this is uh, another. You can see the head of the armadillo, the claws, very, very similar to that of the pangolin that we just looked at. But take a closer look. This is not modified hair uh, scales. This is dermal bone. This is bone that has risen to the surface and become this hard shell. You can see the backside here of the uh, of the skeleton skeleton and the inside. And so um, if you look very close, you can see some of the uh, vestigial hair on this armadillo. 
But if we flip them over upside down, again, these individuals roll into balls to protect themselves from predators, but you can see they still do have quite a bit of natural, uh, more, more normal hair on their underbellies. Now, armadillos have been expanding their range in North Carolina, and they have been documented in quite a few counties now, but um, they are insectivores and omnivores. They eat uh, basically anything they can fit uh, through their little tubular snouts, but mostly insects, grubs, things like that. So, Mike, um, I have a question about, yes. um, it's another opinion question, sorry. Uh oh the all these How opinions. Do you, <laughs> what is your thought about animals like coyotes and armadillos that are kind of naturally expanding their range? Um, mm -hmm. Like, be it, you know, maybe, like, I feel like coyotes are maybe filling a niche that has been left unoccupied, and, you know, armadillos are clearly you know, having success expanding their range. Is that something, do you think, that should be stopped? Or do you think that we should just say, well, that's, you know, they're coming and and and, <laughs> and see how, how everybody else adjusts? Okay, I have, uh, yes, I have an answer prepared for that to some extent. We're here on Darwin Day, right? So I might as well put it in the context of these are natural invaders. I think the fact that they are colonizing new habitats, whether it's due to uh, climate change, anthropogenic, or human changes to the habitat. Um, this, this is—they're not going away. They are; uh, their ranges are expanding, and that range is going to continue um, as long as the factors favor their their survival. Right, and so I think in many cases those are instances where we should be studying what their impacts are, and um, and they're going to be context specific. Where in some areas we might have to manage a species, and in others we should just let them let them be and do their thing. And but but again, study what the consequences of those natural and. For example, um, you know, the introductions of species either on purpose or, um, <clears throat> or by accident. Uh, I do think that those uh, human-mediated translocations and introductions should be managed and, and removed as quickly as possible because that's not a natural process that could cause catastrophic changes to ecosystems. Like cats. Like like feral cats or introduced red foxes to the Australian right. outback, um, thing, species like that, yes. It's really okay. interesting. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going to talk about characters just one second, because I've just heard people talk about, like, say, um, like ground nesting birds and um, turtles, for example, mm -hmm. that foxes, you know, I think maybe because of urbanization and foxes are seeing that success, are having a really adverse effect on these things. And then when coyotes come, they displace the foxes and then the turtles, the birds have a little more ability to successfully nest, which I think is a plus in the coyote column. Right, yeah. And I think, again, a lot of these changes are, are still pretty novel and we're still just now uh, learning and studying these species for biodiversity in our state, but across the globe. Cool. So let's get back to um, armor and protection. So I have another iconic species here. Not a North Carolina species, but a North American species. The North American porcupine. So this is uh, another perfect example of adaptive uh, hair uh, function. And so you can see here, I'll pet it. So as long as I'm petting it um, uh, again with the grain, uh, you can see that there's a lot of these soft guard hairs that are no problem. Um, but you could see towards the rear here, lots and lots of these modified hair quills. And so there's there's this old wives tale that, um, that uh, porcupines throw their quills. And really what it is is uh, when uh, think about when you get excited or you're nervous or something, all your hair stands up on your arm or on your legs. Well, uh, the porcupines have the same, or or your dog, for example, fluffs up when when they get nervous. Well, porcupines have the same thing, and so these quills stand up at at alert, and really they will just back up or or try to uh, run away from something, and all it takes is 
tapping on those and getting um, some soft skin against them for or them kind of shaking their tail at you or backing up into you to cause um, some serious damage to your your hand, your face, or or more likely your dog's uh, poor snout. So um, here's so porcupines are the second largest rodent in North America here. So you can see just how big some of these individuals can get. Uh, huge, huge claws, uh, very cool, uh, adapted for uh, climbing trees, pine trees. Um, and then uh, more convergence. We are here on Darwin Day. More modified hair, hedgehogs. So hedgehogs, again, uh, uh, similar, um, but not, rod uh, porcupines are rodents. Hedgehogs are insectivores. These are more closely related to shrews and moles. And so these are, uh, some of these are African species of hedgehogs. And so you can see they're not quite as, ow, ow, ow. <laughs> I, <laughs> that's funny. Um, they are quite spiny and their underbelly is soft. And so they, again, similar to some of the other species we've looked at, roll up into balls uh, to protect themselves from predators. Um, and okay, and then I am going to go to one more uh, convergent trip here. <clears throat> this is a totally wild species. This is the short beaked echidna. This is from um, uh, Australia and Tasmania. And again, you could see these modified hair make these giant, very, very dense. These are, these are the largest of the quills that, of the individual animals that we just looked at. But you can see total convergence in, um, in their morphology of their face uh, with the pangolins and armadillos. They're insectivores. They have long tongues. They have super, super strong uh, claws to dig up things like ant mounds, termite mounds. But these are also what we call the monotremes. And the monotremes, are some of the earliest mammals. And what's interesting about uh, echidnas uh, and the other monotremes are platypuses. They do not have uh, nipples. They, they produce milk, but they do not have nipples for their young to receive the milk. So their milk actually uh, just kind of leaks out and flows along the quills uh, in some of the areas where the mammary ducts are. And the young uh, drink uh, along the quills. Uh, monotremes are also totally unique because they do not have normal genitals. They have cloacas and they lay eggs. So these are the egg laying mammals. So um, that's, pro I, I don't know, I guess uh, what I think we should do is leave it there because if you, you should probably end on a super armored uh, egg laying mammal. And um, with that, I would love to uh, see if anyone has any questions about mammal hair or evolution or other uh, tricky opinion questions yes. that I'm going to get myself into trouble answering. All right. Uh, well, that was so great. I love it so much. Um, what a wonderful tour of the basement and the collection. Um, one of the things I think that... Um, that these cabinets are really special and and it maybe um and because what is the main threat to the collection bugs bugs and humidity so, so these actually are, sorry so these cabinets are, are are you said you did say they were airtight but that's to keep out the bugs and the humidity Yes. And so uh, obviously in a, a, like in the building underground, in um, we're able to control the climate and environment down here. And so we try to maintain um, super low humidity, cool uh, temperatures uh, to make sure that we preserve these specimens for as long as possible. So um, I, I will show you, I will uh, take a, take a second here because um we, we are down in the mammal collection and, uh, you know, Carrie, I, I do like my rodents. Um, so I'm going to just pull out a few um, examples to show you. Uh, you know, we, we looked at 
we looked at some of the the bigger a lot of the bigger species, but I want to look at a few of the um, smaller species. So you can see rodents are the most diverse of the mammals, right? And so they have much smaller, narrower shelves and are packed pretty tight here. But um, what species was I going to look at? Uh, Ocratomes. Um, so uh, if if there's questions, I'm happy to keep taking them while I look for uh, the particular specimens that I was interested yeah. in. So we had a question on YouTube. So um, um, they uh, talking about the armadillos, and I think you mentioned this, but um, but maybe just to clarify, are the armor are the armor plates are bone, right? It's it's they're actually bone. They're not skin or hair. Right. Right. Okay. Um, and okay, so I love Jerry, all these drawers. Saying, oh, sorry, I say I love all these drawers. I can't. Oh yeah, I know, just endless. Um, okay, so the the importance of the collection, we have to save these uh, specimens and preserve them for the future, so that scientists can use them again. Um, uh, in, in the future um, to study where species historically occurred and where they will or won't occur in the future. But so um, the importance of these cabinets is that, again, they're airtight. We're able to keep uh, bugs and other pests out. And uh, you'd be amazed because I'm going to try to showcase some of these dates. So let's look here. Let's zoom in. Um, so do you see some dates on there? Yeah, actually, we have a fantastic view. 1892. 1892. And you could look at those individual, those are uh, golden mice. Um, and they don't look all that much older than these individuals from 19, what is that? 60, 1955, 1965 from Wake County. From right here can you, in Rome. Can you put your hand by them, Mike, just to kind of give us some scale? Okay. <laughs> Look at these teensy tiny mice. They're about medium-sized yeah. mice. No, they're they're medium-sized. These are uh, golden mice, yeah. They, it's hard to tell. The, the video probably doesn't do them justice, but they have a nice, a beautiful golden sheen to them. They're pretty beautiful. We can yeah. see that. So, but you so can I have a couple see... questions from the chat. Yeah. So Mary yeah. wants to know, how long ago did the other osteoderms go extinct? And oh a follow-up, does the collection have any? Oh, my goodness. Um, so uh, obviously other, other mega armadillos and things like that um, have been extinct for thousands of years. But there were also a variety of species of them. So I can't put a, like a single uh, term on when they went extinct, but um, it's most of them uh, went extinct at the change with the uh, Pleistocene. Um, so uh, several, like thousands and thousands of years ago. But other species um, that, are, that are similarly related, uh, the Xenarthrans, uh, which include the sloths, armadillos, um, anteaters. Uh, some of those, like like the giant ground sloth we have upstairs in the museum, you know, they were here in even in North Carolina up until just 10,000 years ago or so. So we think about a lot of these uh, kind of ancient mammal species as being extinct for um, thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, probably millions of years. And many of them, um, you know, coexisted with humans. And in fact, humans contributed typically, uh, humans and, and some climatic changes uh, typically contributed to their extinctions. Yeah, and I just want to plug a talk we had earlier today called How Did Glyptodon Get Its Shell? And so you will be able to find that talk all about <laughs> all about the giant armadillos um, on our YouTube channel. So if anybody wants to go back and watch that, it's really fascinating. Um, and she did say that they think that it was a human-induced um, uh, extinction for those. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so R has another opinion question. Oh, but you great. might like that. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe this one's really hard. It's really hard for me. Um, what is your favorite mammal? Oh, my favorite mammal? Yeah. Um, I have a handful of species that are among my favorites. I, I have a hard time picking just one. But um, we'll go... 
we'll go uh, look at the, so the jaguar is one of my favorite mammals. They have the strongest jaws of all the cats. Um, they, they kill their prey much different than most other cats where they, um, <clears throat> they attack the most other big cats attack the prey of, of across the neck and jaguars attack their prey from behind and crush their skull because they have such giant uh, master and temporalis muscles that just that their jaws are so strong they crush their prey skull and i just think that's pretty pretty crazy but i am here uh, speaking of skulls we don't have a skin unfortunately but i will show you the skull of my favorite mammal here which is the i'm going to get in some good light kind of tricky one giant anteater so talk about talk about evolution and cool adaptations so this is the skull of the giant anteater and uh giant anteaters you know uh are like over a hundred pounds right and they live exclusively off of ants and so giant anteaters they kind of farm their ants, right? And they're, they're foragers. And so they have these giant home ranges because a single giant anteater has to eat over 30,000 ants a day to sustain itself. Now, um, ants uh, are noxious, right? They're, they have pincers and they have venoms. So a giant anteater can only uh, feed at a single nest for a few minutes before they're so swarmed with ants and being stung all over their bodies and face that they have to move on to the next uh, ant mound. And that's just like, whoa, you know, how, how did they, that become a thing? And it's because they have these crazy adaptations. They have very small eyes. You can barely see an eye socket there um, because they don't need them. They, they smell uh, most of their prey. They have very, very small ears. You could see almost no auditory canal because again, eyes and ears are very sensitive if your uh, prey can uh, sting and bite you. And so really they just have these, you know, two and a half, three foot long tongue. They have these giant claws that make the claws of the uh, pangolin and armadillo look tiny. And they uh, specialize in the giant, giant uh, termites and, and ants that create these giant mounds uh, throughout Central and South America. So I think they're probably uh, the coolest of, of the mammals, really. Uh, super, super special. That's awesome. Okay, well, we are out of time. Mike, thank you so much. This has just been, I mean, I could spend all day here with you. So, and I think probably the, our, our audience agrees, um, but we have another program starting. So I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. Thank you for giving us this fabulous tour. And if you're in town, um, we have in-person Darwin Day on Saturday from 10 to 3. So please come out and join us out on the plaza. It's going to be a great day of fun and activities. Um, I just want to say thank you to our museum members and thank you to our sponsor, an anonymous donor. Everybody have a great afternoon. I'll see you in another program or on Saturday. Thank you. Have a Bye -bye. great day.